Welcome to the Teach Better Talk podcast, your official podcast for the Teach Better Podcast Network, the hub for all things education, brought to you by teachbetter.com. The Teach Better Talk podcast is committed to answering your burning questions through a variety of lenses and bringing new offers to you and your colleagues to help you thrive throughout the school year. My name is Ray Hewart, and we love your questions here on the pod. If you have any questions that you'd love us to consider as topics for future episodes, please share them with us by emailing info at teachbetter.com. What are the factors leading to stress and overload for our leaders? We are diving into some key questions as we kick off our week, focusing on stress, understanding stress, and also understanding what are the contributing factors so we can be a part of the solution. Before we get too far in, I do want to give a shout out to Amanda on our Teach Better team. Amanda, for those of you who have connected with her before, is an incredible incredible member of our internal team who loves to send out birthday cards and all the feel-good gifts you might be receiving from the Teach Better team. Well, I would love to say that every card you get is actually handwritten by me. The reality is that Amanda's been doing this for us for years, and she is our feel-good leader. So shout out to Amanda for making our stress here internally and within our community a little bit better by those bright and shiny moments. We love you, Amanda. As we get into this topic, we are bringing in an expert, and I am so excited to feature him. How are you doing this afternoon? Thanks for recording with us. Hey, hey, Ray and everyone in the Teach Better family. Uh, my name is Damon Harris, and I'm excited to be here. David, I'm so appreciative that you are coming in because if there's anyone to bring in to talk about leadership skills, stressors, how to overcome them, you are a leading expert in this. And I so appreciate that you are going to be able to share some insight with our community. Before we get too far in, in case we have somebody new to the pod or maybe they haven't yet connected with you, uh, I'd love to have you share a little bit about what you do because you seem to do a lot. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm involved with a few different things. And sort of my one of my life philosophies is that I try to keep my, my head on a swivel to, to find out who are some good people and some smart people doing good work. And I kind of wander over there and see what they're doing. And then I often get involved. Um, during the day, my day job is the senior manager of educator advancement and IHE institutions of higher education partnerships for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, which is in Maryland between Baltimore and DC, and we border Baltimore. It's a district of about 85,000 kids in 125 or so schools. Um, and then we do good work with a diverse group of families, students, and staff. Mm -hmm. um, on the side, I do a number of different things, one of which is I am the co-director of a nonprofit called the Building Our Network of Diversity, or Bond Project. And it's a nonprofit that supports the recruitment, retention, empowerment, and development of men of color in education uh, because we need, um, we need belonging and we need groups and we need acceptance. Um, and so our group fights for those efforts and we partner with those who are doing the same. I'm also the author of The Anti-Racist School Leader, What to Know, Say, and Do. Um, it came out last year on Solution Tree Press. I'm really excited about that. Gives six broad uh, sort of strokes of, about which anyone in schools or who cares about schools can use to, to make our, our schools and our educational institutions better places. Aside from that, I am an adjunct instructor with three different universities or two universities in the college. And I am also on a number of boards for nonprofits and for-profit organizations that support um, mental well-being, that support student, student needs, um, educator preparation, you name it. And lastly, I'm also the co-host of, it's probably not, it's lastly for this anyway, I'm the co-host of a radio show on public radio in DC. It's called You Must Learn. It's on uh, WPFW FM in Washington. And we talk once a week about ed liberatory educational topics. And that means anyone who's doing work with folks or to support work for folks who are usually on the margins with respect to education, anybody trying to move those folks to the center of the action, and we want to hear about that work. You know, it's too bad you uh, don't have any goals or ambitions in your life. I feel like uh, <laughs> you are so busy and so busy 
doing work that is going to be and continues to be so impactful for our field. Friends, that's what I'm trying to tell you. If you're listening to the pod today, this is a gentleman that you need to add to your PLN because this work is just going all over the place. Let's go back to the book. I know there's so many things that we could dive into as far as your expertise. And that's why we want to make sure we get as much out of this podcast episode as humanly possible. But tell us about the book. It just came out uh, about a year ago. Solution Tree was the publisher. And I know that so many educators have already picked up the book. However, this is actually a great book that we can recommend to our communities listening now to consider doing a book study with, with their colleagues or leadership team. Do you mind telling us a little bit about what they can expect from the book and also where they can grab it? Absolutely. And folks can grab it anywhere great books are sold. I know our my publisher, Solution Tree, would like you to go to solutiontree.com and, and search for Damon, D-A-M-A-N Harris there. And um, but you could also find it on Amazon or Borders or anywhere you find your books. This book will be there. And um, I, I used I've been a bunch of different roles in education from uh, before and after care providers to teacher's assistant to classroom teacher to assistant principal, principal, district administrator, district wide coach. I've been a lot of things and uh, I've had a number of opportunities to influence what goes on in the schools uh, in which I work. And so some some of what I picked up, I share. And when things started to be more apparent to folks who don't normally face obstacles that are related to race or gender or socioeconomic status, when things started to flare up well, now three, four or five years ago, um, although it's always been around, um, it, it was, I began talking with more folks outside of my community, my school communities about this work. And as I travel around to, to different spaces in our country, um, and recently last summer, I went to Ghana to, to talk about some of this work too. Um, but the when as I travel around the country, folks often ask me, what is it that, like, I know that there are some things that are going wrong. I know we've had these hierarchies of our in our demographics that say, these are always, this group of students is always performing or typically performing at the best. This group of students is typically performing the worst or um, the best, or they're at the top of all the good categories, right? But the bottom of all the bad categories. I know that, but I don't know what to do about that. Um, you know, things have been like this in my school forever and I don't know how to change it. So I wrote this book and said, here's what you can do in six broad strokes. Um, it's really practical, uh, things that folks can apply right away after reading. They can educate yourself and commit to the topic. There are a number of different ways spelled out in, in chapter one about how you can educate yourself on this field and sort of move yourself forward, at least orient yourself in the right direction and begin moving uh, in that way. You can learn how to cast a vision to the stakeholders in your community. So oftentimes folks say, but I don't know who to share it with or how to share it. That's there. And now you also have to bring your staff along with you, whether you're a principal or a teacher leader or a family member in the community who's really excited about this work. Some of our older students might even want to push these buttons. So you need to take your staff there. So how do you design professional learning in a way that helps folks see obstacles, helps folks understand that they have the knowledge and skills to do something about those obstacles to some of your students and their families and how to motivate them to use those skills in order to do that? With this comes resistance. So chapter four is all about how you embrace resistance. You welcome resistance. You ask for it because it makes your ideas stronger. It makes your, your vision more collective. And it's that way your school can move forward in this work. How to elevate anti-racist curricula and instruction. That is the core part of what we do in schools. So how do you do that? What, what makes a curricula anti-racist? What makes instruction culturally responsive or anti-racist? It's in chapter five. And lastly, you need to make sure you know what the impact is of your work that you're doing with this, with respect to anti-racism. This chapter six spells out a comprehensive way that you can be circumspect in the in your approach to collecting data, analyzing data, and sharing the data with the folks in your community this, with respect to the things you are doing to deconstruct and rebuild some of those policies and practices that have created what I said at the beginning, those demographic hierarchies 
of folks that are always there. So from educating yourself through uh, educating your staff, through um, analyzing your impact, the book goes from cover to cover, steps along the way that folks can use. I love this. Friends, if you are trying to figure out, I know this episode's coming out in late October. If you're trying to figure out when this might be a good book to introduce to staff, I love giving books as end of year holiday gifts to staff members. This is mm -hmm. perfect to buy a bunch of books and either hand them out to everyone in the building or buy a little variety of books and leave them in the teacher's lounge and say, hey, pick up your next book for your, you know, for your nice next read on whether they're going to the beach over winter break or just relaxing at home in front of the fire. This to me, Damien, is the perfect book to introduce to educators that are looking to be better, which is all educators in our Teach Better family. So I would really encourage, especially our leadership who might be thinking about those holiday gifts just around the corner, about a month or two away. Uh, this could be something that you grab just a handful of and really try and it's slowly introduce to your teachers. And what I love about your book, Damien, is that it's not done in a threatening way. It's very solution focused, bringing awareness, allowing educators to really step into being a part of the right side of this type of work. We really need to see growth in it sooner rather than later. So I appreciate that you have been able to do the work to publish this book. And I know so many people have already enjoyed it, but cannot wait for some new readers to start even as early as next week. I agree. And folks, teachers, it's okay you, for you to buy this for your administrators to say, hey, just, just thinking, you know, leave it as a secret, secret Santa gift <laughs> in, the, in the box. I think they'll appreciate that too. Oh my gosh, I'm such a sucker for like grabbing, I want to say like not too many because it gets expensive, but grabbing like three to five of my favorite education book slash resources, bundling them up and either re-gifting them or gifting them to somebody else. This would be one that I would absolutely put in the pile because there's lots of books out there, friends. We know so many of you are currently reading books on how to be better at assessment or how to... I don't know, build relationships with students more authentically. This has to be a topic that becomes a part of our annual repertoire of having these conversations and being better in this space. So this is a really trusting book that, you know, has the Teach Better stamp of approval. This one is definitely one that you can utilize. And Damien, I'm so excited for people to give feedback on not only if they've read it previously, but if they're rereading it over the holiday break. That's a really great option for us to keep this conversation going. Absolutely. And I'll be happy to zoom in or video call in once or twice if anyone is reading this as a book study with your staff to hop in free of charge to, to talk. Just say that you heard this on Teach Better. I don't do that for everybody. So just say you heard it on Teach Better that I'll, I'll hop in and have conversations. I'm ready. I love it. Look at those freebies already starting early on in the episode. We're going to dive into a little bit more of the stressors that our leadership exists within. And I think this is such an important topic because whether we're talking about any type of leader that has the official title of leader or just an educational leader that exists anywhere in our school system, stressors that create burnout and lead to um, negative feelings is a reality of so many of us. The sooner we can understand those, have the empathy for them, and start to make steps towards being a part of the solution, the better. So we'll be right back diving into this concept. Stick with us. Quick pause to talk about school-wide observation and teacher one-on-one -on -one coaching. Depending on how you're doing your school networking this year, we want to encourage you to head over to teachbear.com and truly look at how you can observe your teachers more closely and give them one-on-one -on -one coaching to meet their goals. We all want to reach all learners, but are we reaching all teachers? Did you know that most Teach Better strategic plans allow for not only in-person workshops, but also classroom observation that allows for teacher one-on-one -on -one coaching after the fact. We want to see it in person. We want to help your teachers and we want to build a relationship with the people that matter most to you. Head over to teachbearcom slash professional development to see what plan might work for your school. What factors are leading to our leadership stress and overload? We are diving in with our expert guest, and we have a lot to dive into. 
As many of you know, there are countless stressors that leaders may be experiencing. And regardless of what role you have in education, you probably have your own list of stressors that you've been experiencing. Let's better identify what those are, bring awareness to the ones that you may not be exposed to or be thinking of top of mind, and get into some solutions. We're focusing on this all week, but this episode, we're focusing on this conversation with Damian Harris. Where is the right place to start? When I bring up this concept of what contributes to stress in leadership, I feel like, Damian, you must have an endless list, right? <laughs> an endless list. Yes. And it, it is, I think that administrators and school school leaders more, more broadly, they all feel like they have an endless list of things to do. So that's probably there. The, but the place I tend to start when I have these conversations with, with folks in the general public is with a disclaimer. Mm -hmm. So as I said earlier, I've been in a lot of different roles and in, in the last 28 years, I'm beginning my 29th year now, I'm into my 29th year as this is, this is Aaron. Um, there is no no role that works harder than a classroom teacher. So that's where I start. So nobody works harder than classroom teachers. I've been I've been everything except superintendent and nobody. So maybe superintendent. I don't know about that yet, but nobody works harder than classroom teachers. So that's that's that. Well, and I think that's an important note. So many, so often on the on the show on the pod, we discuss the stressors of classroom teachers, and we discuss possible solutions. It's nice to have a week where we kind of see beyond that because we know so many educators in the educational ecosystem aren't able to to have the same stressors that a classroom teacher may have. So better understanding our coaches, our principals, our assistant principals, our directors, our cafeteria staff, our stakeholders, that allows our classroom teachers to be better whole, wholeheartedly. So we're not leaving them out of this conversation. They're still included, but we are looking also at the other roles that support those pieces as well. Absolutely. And I can see some folks from cultures like mine is, that are thinking in their minds right now, what's understood doesn't need to be said. I get I get it. I'm sorry. I got you. And so the, um, the, the pieces that administrators, school, when I was a school leader and now at the central office level supporting school leaders, the things that I hear the most are things that ring true with folks from, from long ago. So we're still talking about high stakes testing or high stakes financial situations. Now they have to juggle the budget and they have to um, manage some of the things that are going on with politics. Right. So whether you're talking about the types of books that are in classroom libraries or school libraries, or you're talking about um, issues related to race or related to gender or sexual orientation, those are all things now that school administrators are supposed to be experts in. Right. They ain't go to school for that. So these, this is all trial and error. And folks are really trying to feel their way through often with little guidance from up above until things get a little more intense. And in more recent cases, folks have also had to stress with the um, our entrance into the pandemic and our transition out of the pandemic to wherever we are in this space now, um, that managing situations with instruction from that virtual space to now playing catch up with students who've had that virtual instruction that was a little subpar in a lot of in a lot of cases how are we sort of pushing ourselves to get past that that all falls on the principal uh, every principal in every school every assistant principal in every school and so folks are really struggling with that as well as all the emotional and social supports that students need coming out of that as well as their caregivers as well as our staff we, we are juggling a number of different things and with a number of different issues related to the emotional, and physical, psychological needs of the folks in our care. That means also that that comes with a lot of emotional burden that comes from secondary trauma or vicarious trauma. So we as school leaders, you hear about every student's trouble. You hear about all many parents and caregivers troubles you hear about many if not all of your staff's troubles and you have to carry that on your own and on your own means an additional layer of isolation that administrators feel so there isn't another principal 
in the school. There are often very few, if if any, assistant principals in the school. So folks are really dealing with these things alone on a day-to-day basis. And it can become overwhelming. Uh, And to carry that weight year in and year out, if a district uh, doesn't structure a support network in a way that can help principals manage that, that stress, help principals offload some of that emotional burden, it can be really challenging. And in the last five, six years, there have been a growing um, call or a growing awareness of what folks are calling the staffing shortage. So it's been so hard to get teachers of every different stripe to get in, in terms of whether they're special education teachers or classroom teachers or teachers assistants, um, art teachers, you name it. All of these folks were coming up short in. And so principals bear the burden of saying, we have to find staff. And if we don't, we have to find subs. And if we don't, I have to get in there. And I have to do that. Um, And that is a lot of, again, a lot of labor, a, a large burden that folks have to carry. So across all kinds of issues of emotional or physical well-being, principals are stressing. Then you add on the paperwork side of things that principals are stressing. And then you add on the the expectations of high stakes tests and attendance uh, metrics that that principals are being held responsible for whether their students come to school. Um, Schools have some influence over that, but there are a lot of societal structural issues that lead to that. So there's just so many different issues that it can seem like a like a wave that principals or assistant principals and other school leaders face on a daily basis that make it hard for folks to to maintain. Something I really value about starting the conversation this way, especially as the first episode this week, is being able to reflect on everything you just shared. I don't know that you identified an area for me that I was unaware of, right? I'm like, every time you had a new I, new concept that, you know, adds stress to administrator, I'm like, oh yeah, and that one. Oh yeah, and that for sure. Oh, absolutely, never thought of it that way. An element of this though, is being aware of all these stressors on a consistent basis so we can have empathy for our leaders as they move forward. I have more often than not in my, in my time teaching for over a decade at the middle school level, would see my administrator walking around with a worried face and be like, uh-oh, definitely don't go talk to them this morning. They they got something on their mind. Gosh, they can't they just start the day with a smile? And the reality is, is they have so many pieces of their role that as a as a teacher, I may have been aware of subconsciously, but truly not giving credit for on the day-to-day basis. And I really appreciate being able to highlight the few, I know there's even more that you didn't even highlight, but the few that you were able to highlight to say, gosh, all that, and they have a job to do, like all that. And you didn't mention anything (laughs) about like leading a staff or um, being an instructional leader or following up. Like, I just think some of that like is a little comical to say, oh, yikes, <laughs> that's yeah, a rough go. If they, if, if they, get, if they can um, lead, go watch teachers teach and give feedback, if they can interact with students and, and see how they're learning, if they get a chance to help parents grow and help and talk to parents so parents can help them grow, Those are things that keep them in the building. Those aren't stressors, right? So that's what we signed up for. That's what we want to do. That's the dream of the job. So absolutely, that's just the other things that get in the way. Yeah, I will say one of the ones that we even spoke before we recorded, and I know you shared it here as well. I think I forget that our leaders carry the, the weight and stress and burden of everyone they serve in addition to their own role. I have many a times gone through a rough patch as an educator, walked into my principal's office, made them aware of something that was happening in my own life. And, you know, then I leave the, I leave the office and I, I try and, you know, 
move forward, hoping that I have the empathy of my leadership to support me through that difficult time. The perspective and the reminder for all of us that I'm not the only teacher doing it that day. And there are students that are giving that same uh, value to the principal. There are so many other people in addition to, I don't know, they're humans too. They have their own stressors in their own life. I, I think I forget that piece. That's a really beautiful reminder in October. Because I think sometimes when we get stressed, at least when I get stressed as a human, I become very tunnel vision. My own problems, you know, take up take up everything I can see. And I forget that there are so many other things that people are experiencing that the principals, the leadership are carrying the weight of, or at least have such great empathy for. There's weight to that as well. And as we get toward this time of year where the days are getting shorter, so folks or principals are arriving to school and it's dark outside. Yeah. Somebody's waiting for them. They get outside and somebody's waiting at the door for them to tell them an issue. Right. And then by the time they leave, it's dark outside. And somebody is waiting at the door to share that last issue before they walk out. So yes, there, there's a lot to consider as an administrator. And often folks go into it with really high hopes uh, because they want to make change. They want to change the world. They want to make places better places for all of us. So we, they fight. We fight really hard, um, mm -hmm. but sometimes it becomes too overwhelming and we need to get some help. You know, so much of this is just a, a, a call to action for empathy. Anything we can do for our leaders to have a little bit more understanding and care in this area, I think, is maybe the first step in being a part of the solution. The other things is what I know you're alluding to, which we're going to get into next, which is discussing what we can do about these stressors, because some of them do have some action steps that we can put in place. Some of them might just be acceptance that this is the role that we're in, and we just need to find the healthiest way to manage it. What comes to mind for you? Yeah, so the, there are a number of different things that folks can probably put into practice at the school district level or at the schoolhouse level that can support some, some school leaders in all the different things that they face. Uh, you may give, well, we'll start with that access to mental health care, mm -hmm. right? And an encouragement to, to exercise self-care and maybe some learn some mindfulness practices. Like those things are helpful for folks, just everybody in the school building, but that is certainly there. How can you help people, uh, school leaders with workload management, right? Can can you, can you someone there teach them how to delegate responsibilities a little bit more? Everything doesn't have to be done by the principal, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they can do some high priority stuff, but there are other things that other members of the staff can manage on their own. Uh, can they use technology to streamline some of these tasks? You don't have to write out, like when I was in this, the, um, the school building, I, I learned how to do um, informal observations from my phone using the Google, a Google uh, form, a, you know, electronic form. So like that stuff is are ways that can help folks streamline some of those tasks to take some of the burden off of some of the things they do. You certainly have to give principals mentorship. Um, in my school district, all new administrators, whether assistant principals, principals in their first two years, in, in my former district, it was the same way. Everybody got a coach, everybody got or a mentor, you call it that. There are affinity groups or peer networks that you can help folks form so they can support each other and reduce that sense of isolation. There's there are a number of different things that folks can do to make this more of a positive culture and a professional learning sort of opportunity and not just leave folks on their own to try to swim um, among all the different things that they have to face. I do want to give a special shout out to Joshua Stamper and many members participating in our Teach Better support that we offer here internally on the team. If you are an educational leader in any way, shape, or form, a coach, an assistant principal, a principal, a director, a superintendent, whatever, we do have a administrator mastermind that meets every single week. It is mm -hmm. not recorded. It's completely free. People come together. They share ideas. Sometimes there's a guest facilitator. Sometimes it's just an internal community and uh, people kind of pop in as they can. You know, one week you get really busy. You got that meeting you can't miss or that email that you got to focus on. Other weeks you're like, hey, I have an hour to commit to myself. I'm going to go pop into this 45 minute 
free community meeting. So if you're interested in that, head over to teachbetter.com slash mastermind and you can take advantage. Again, sign up, show up when you want. But again, another opportunity to create a community to support yourself. I loved your suggestion of getting a mentor or a coach. Uh, I recently did that this year, which has been a while since I've had a specific mentor I'm leaning on on a consistent basis. I forget how nice it is to have somebody share insight that is outside of your bubble. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I totally agree. I have coaches and mentors for myself personally and professionally. Um, and I, I serve as a mentor coach to a number of folks personally and professionally. I think it is, it is the number one success tool um, for folks. Like I know there's educational credentials. That stuff is cool. But people who've lived the life that you are trying to live can be very instructive with guidance and sharing, just being able to unload some of the things you're experiencing is certainly helpful as well. Um, there, there are a number of different ways you can do that. So my bond, my, my nonprofit, one of the things we talk about is that we need to make sure that in some cases there are considerations for race and gender when we determine who are gonna be our coaches, because there, there are some things that, um, Brian Cadogan, Cadogan, one of our members, who's now an international teacher in Brazil, I think, but Brian uh, said, my mentor from outside is a, is a white woman and I'm a black man. We have the same role in the, in the school district and she can hear me, but she can't feel me. Right. Yeah. There's a difference um, in that in a lot of cases. And so that isolation for some men of color in schools or some other, you name the group, demographic group, sometimes there's a sense of double isolation. So yeah. maybe there's not someone, another school leader, and there's not another person of color or a woman of color in the same role, in the same vicinity to, to whom you can you can talk. Yeah, Damien, I'll be honest. I I feel as though we didn't even get to touch on on nearly the resources that you provide to school leaders and educators on a consistent basis. I want to first off apologize for that in this episode, but also I really do want to encourage everyone listening. This is a great opportunity to connect with Damien and start those questions off. This is somebody who is very accessible, always somebody that you can lean on as far as dialogue. I reached out to you randomly. I'm sure you were like, who's this wacky chick that wants me to come on a podcast? And you responded so beautifully. And so I do just want to just share with all of you. There is so much in this podcast episode we didn't even get to touch on. This is your invitation to choose to take your understanding of this into your own hands, connect with Damien and continue to be a part of the solution. And of course, continue to get the support you deserve and need. Um, there are so many organizations, whether they be profit or nonprofit, that are aimed to support leaders and not all of them are great. And Damien's is amazing. So this is the one that you definitely need to go check out and make sure that you're whether you're taking advantage of the opportunities that they offer or just becoming more aware so you can recommend it to somebody else. There's there's great things happening there. So Damien, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the work that you do and so glad that you provide that type of support for leaders across the country. Thanks for that, Ray. I think you're doing great work here too. That's why I'm here. <laughs> it's so fun. Hey, the more the merrier, right? People always joke that there's different organizations doing so many things. I'm like, friends, get as many people in your corner as possible. That's the goal. Yeah, there, there's enough work out there for all of us. There's enough Amen. things to do. <laughs> so true. Friends, stick with us. We're going to get into uh, some major takeaways from this episode and also contact information. So we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by S'more. If creating an engaging school newsletter has been challenging, S'more is here to help. This simple, education-focused tool offers customizable templates where you can easily drag and drop text, images, videos, and more to create a newsletter people will actually read. Sending it to a multilingual community? No worries. S'more lets you translate your newsletters in more than a hundred languages. Not sure what to include in your newsletters? <laughs> Stop guessing. Use the built-in analytics to see who opens your emails and which links get clicked. 
Ready to impress your school community? Get started at s'more.com slash teach better. We've been able to just skim the surface of what our leaders are experiencing as far as stress and overload. This has been an amazing episode with so many key takeaways and awareness brought to a very important topic we'll be focusing on all week long. Before we get into some contact information so that you can add Damian Harris to your PLN, we're also going to ask him to identify a key takeaway that he hopes all of you consider. So for our key takeaway section, Damian, we'd love to have our community make sure they're walking away with something on their mind. What should we challenge them with? So we only touched, scratch the surface in talking about race or, or gender. And I, and sometimes that can be a scary topic. So I, I just I want to make sure that I say that forming and belonging to groups is unavoidable, right? but it's not wrong because it's, it's the human condition. So we crave membership in groups. That's what we do. We find, we make us and them about, you name it, sports teams, school buildings, politics, everything. We make us and them about, about groups. And that doesn't make you evil, that makes you human. What we need to do, especially those of us who are in schools, who are in educators, we need to be aware of that proclivity to, to form groups and expand our network, expand our group, expand that us to make sure we include everybody in our school communities. So start talking about we and our and not them and their when you're talking about your kids, your students, I'm sorry, your, their caregivers, even your central office folks, the community members, all of the, all of them, all of you are we, are us. And if you keep that mindset, um, all the other things will seem a little less daunting. Mm. That might be my favorite takeaway we have ever had on an episode so far for Teach Bear Talk podcast. I really appreciate it. Damien, how can our community stay connected to you so that they can continue this conversation? This definitely cannot be the end. Gotcha. I am, my name is Damon, D-A-M-A-N Harris. And you can find me on X at Damon underscore Harris. You can also find me on LinkedIn where I am most um, active. Just Damon Harris, D-A-M-A-N Harris. You can find me online at DamonHarris.com. You find out some of the things I do, more about me. Um, you can find out about Bond, the Bond Project, my nonprofit, um, at BondEducators.org online or at BondEducators on X or Instagram. Damon, help, you can, you know, we can find me at Damon, at, or you can contact me at Damon at DamonHarris.com. I love it. Damon, I'm so appreciative that you were able to come on the pod. And friends, if you ever have any issues connecting with Damon, please just reach out to anybody here on the Teach Better team. We'd love to get you connected to him and the work that he's doing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a blessing to be here, Ray. Thank you. <laughs>